Welcome to Modern Latin America in 15 minutes. My, na my name is Dr. Kim Richardson and today we are discussing populism. Last time we ended in our conclusion by discussing uh, this, this flip-flopping back and forth here in Latin America. How in 1930 to 1945 dictatorships predominated, 1945 to 1964 democracy predominated in 1964 to 1985, dictatorship once again. Well, it's during this period, after World War II especially, not solely, but especially, that Latin America turns to a form of government called populism. Not solely in everywhere, but in many places of Latin America, populism. It, populism is defined by focusing on mass politics and winning elections. By focusing on mass politics, who are the masses? Largely, they're the poorer folk, the workers especially. Now, I mean, you can say that the rural folk uh, can participate in populism, and they did, especially in Mexico, but far and wide, it was a working class type of uh, uh, system here. Okay, so there are five, I mean, well, there are five, but there are three great populist leaders. Lázaro Cárdenas, Mexico, Getúlio Vargas, uh, Brazil, and Juan Perón, Argentina. Again, this is, uh, and for these cases, our working class consciousness here. So, the whole point of these three populist leaders is how can we become less neocolonial? Beginning with the Great Depression, right? How do we focus more on import substitution industrialization? How do we focus more on economic nationalism and less on becoming dependent on another country? And this is something that's going to make uh, the working class say, yes, that's a great idea and we'll vote for you. So, Cardenas, Vargas, and Pedro. There are others, again, like uh, uh, Victor Raya, uh, Raul Jaya de la Torre, Jose Maria Velasco Ibarra, and uh, Jorge Eliezer Gaetan. Uh, but we're going to focus really on those three great ones. First with Lazo Cardenas. By the time of uh, the 1930s, the Revolutionary Party that fought, you know, that claimed victory in the Mexican Revolution had changed its name several times to the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, the Revolutionary, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, the PRI. Therefore, the people that uh, are oftentimes supporters of or members of the this party is called the PRIistas, right? Okay, so that's the most important one. Well, in 1934, the president is going to be Lázaro Cárdenas. Now, Cárdenas is going to get most of his support from the people. Remember, one of the key things, there are three key articles of the Constitution of 1917, for which the Mexican Revolution was fought, was land reform. Cárdenas was a big supporter of land reform. He was able to uh, redistribute almost 50 million acres, which is twice that distributed in all of the preceding years uh, combined. So he, of course, got a lot of mass support. He is a populist. And here's a great uh, quote uh, uh, regarding uh, this urgent telegram. The list said, bank reserves dangerously low. Tell the treasurer, said Cardenas. Agricultural production following. Tell the Minister of Agriculture. Railroads bankrupt. Tell the Minister of Communications. Serious message from Washington. Tell Foreign Affairs. Then he opened the telegram which read, My corn dried. My burro died. My sow was stolen. My baby is sick. Signed, Pedro Juan, village of Huitzilpuzuc. Yeah. Order the presidential train at once, said Cardenas. I am leaving for Huitzilpuzuc. Okay, so like the other economic, I mean, other populists, he was an economic nationalist, meaning he wants Latin America to be economically independent, and that is important. Well, two of the great industries that was dominating uh, Mexico was the railroad industry and the um, oil industry. So in 1937 and 38, respectively, he nationalized these two industries. Now, the United States did nothing, and they did nothing because this is the middle of the Great Depression. And instead of sending the Marines in to take it back, 
we establish something called the good neighbor policy. Whereas we're going to be good neighbors to our, our Latin American neighbors. We're going to be nice to them, right? We're not going to overthrow them. It's a little bit more in-depth than that, uh, but that is the key aspect here. He's a populist, economic nationalist, and the United States, being good neighbors, allows him to do uh, many of the things that he does. So Lazaro Cardenas is the first economic uh, a populist leader, and the second is Getulio Vargas. Now, it's kind of a little bit more difficult to discuss because the Estado Novo uh, officially begins in 1937, and then it lasts until 1945. That's a dictatorship. But then in 1945, remember, Brazil turned back to a democracy. But he ran for president, and he was elected in 1950. Right? But when he was elected in 1950, he became a populist, right? economic nationalist above all else. And people really liked him. Right? Uh, as you can see here, he's seen as a father of the poor, a father figure as he's trying to help the masses. And they respond by giving him the vote, just like Cardenas did as well. right? Well, unfortunately, the military decided that had enough of his populist rhetoric, and he was kind of a left-leaning populist, and so uh, they were going to overthrow him, so he chooses to commit suicide in 1954. That's one of the reasons why he's so popular now, because he ended by taking his own life. They do not accuse me, he says in his final letter, his, his uh, what was that called, the suicide note. They insult me, they do not fight me, they slander me, and do not give me the right to defend myself. They need to suffocate my voice and impede my action so that I do not continue to defend, as I have always defended the people and especially the humble. I follow the faith that is imposed on me serenely. I take the first step on the path to eternity, and I leave life to enter into history. So he commits suicide. So there's two populist leaders, economic nationalist. Here's a third populist leader, Juan Perón. Uh, and at the same time, right, in 1945, uh, when the dictatorships were ousted from power, he became the Secretary of Labor. And as Secretary of Labor, he was a good Secretary of Labor in the sense that he got a lot of the support of the labor, and they really liked him. Unfortunately, the government decided to get rid of him, uh, and uh, the workers... And on seventeenth of October, nineteen forty-five, very important date, demonstrated his return. So they were—he was re uh, put back into power, and with this popularity, the following year he's going to be elected president. Who elects him president? The working class. It's, he's a populist president. So, okay, so he was a populist president from nineteen forty-six until nineteen fifty-five meaning that the industrial working class supported him, and he's going to give them a lot of uh, things in response, such as increased, labor, uh, increased uh, wages, uh, uh, pensions, benefits, these kinds of things. He's going to be assisted with his wife, Eva Duarte, Evita, as she's known, uh, who assisted as well, not only that, but got women the right to vote, uh, advocated equal pay for equal work, but unfortunately, she died in 1952, which is one reason why she, just like Vargas, is so famous in history. He also attempted to end foreign ownership. That's economic nationalist. Didn't uh, Cardenas do that same thing? Yes, except Cardenas did it during the Great Depression. Now is post-Great Depression. Now is 19, uh, f uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, and that's much different. By attempting to end ownership, I mean public utilities, meatpacking plants, banks, uh, insurance companies, railroads, securities, you know, social securities expanded. All of these issues here uh, attempts to end foreign ownership, economic nationalist. As a result, the military decided, uh-uh, can't do that, and overthrew him. Remember, the twin pursuits are trade and security, not liberty, justice for all. Here. So, those are three great, quick, quick examples of populism during this period. When does populism end? Well, in Mexico, uh, the Mexican Revolution ended in 1940. Well, therefore, populism in Mexico ended in 1940. You know. In Vargas, 
He committed suicide in 1954. There was no real populist leader after that. And in 1964, uh, dictatorship completely puts the lid on any form of populism. Uh, in 1955, uh, when Peron is uh, ousted, uh, that's the end of him, but, but he's still powerful behind the scenes, right? And so you could argue that populism continue, and he, he's actually re-elected president. But by the time he's elected, re-elected president, he's an old man. So it kind of dies a slow death in Argentina. All right, so this is just a quick overview of post-World War II populism. In many places, the leadership of Latin America see that they have the, the, the politicians, that they could get support of the masses in this new form of government called democracy and perhaps not only be elected to power, but make some change. And those populists wanted to make change, economic nationalistic change. Unfortunately, populism does not last very long. This is Modern Latin America in 15 minutes.